May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Guk Audio Podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of Guk Audio and Guk Archives, helping to preserve the legacy of Shunyu Suzuki and those whose paths cross his. And anything else that comes to mind, I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So today we have part two with Joe Cohen. So last week we had Joe uh, talking about, oh, his life and practice and coming to Zen Center and education and and a lot about his uh, uh, audio business. He's a real true blue audiophile. And today we're getting more into his music history. Um, I will remind you that his business uh, sells very high-end fanatic audio stuff. Is the Lotus Group USA. It's in Nevada, California. Um, and um, so, well, let's just go into it, you know. Uh, and, and he tells a little bit about Zen Center, too. Uh, he tells about an event Suzuki Roshi spoke at, Shunyu Suzuki spoke at, that uh, I guess I heard about it before, 67. Anyway, he talks about it. It's no big deal. He doesn't remember. I think it was the first time he heard him. And he was at a music event, but, it, but uh, you know, all Eastern music in San Francisco. And Suzuki came in and gave a talk. That was interesting. Um, anyway, so let's just go on and give Joe a call and hear what he has to say. So when you uh, hear the bell, if you're of such a mind, uh, hit pause and... Meditate or whatever for as long as you wish. And when you're ready, when you're mentally prepared <laughs> for the podcast, hit unpause. And we'll be there to hit the bell to end the meditation or whatever. And to uh, give Joe Cohen a call. Hey, David. Hi, Joe. So, here we are again. Yeah, we were just uh, we were just listening to the Doobie Brothers on TV. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Oh, <clears throat> wow. Yeah, um, Mark Mark Russo, the sax player, is on Doria's uh, album, Feel the Rhythm. Oh, he plays the sax on her album. Yeah. Well, she had some you know, really hot people on that album. I mean, she had. Abe Laboreal and Alex Acuna and the Turtle Island String Quartet. <laughs> All right. Now, tell us who you're talking about. My wife, Doria. She's a jazz and, singer. And, and uh, 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 well, just tell me about music. Tell me about your music, her music, how you got into music. Uh, <laughs> uh, I know it goes back to India. I'd really like to hear about that. Yeah, well, I mean, music goes all the way back to, I mean, I remember when I was like uh, probably two or three years old dancing to some uh, Eastern sounding music, maybe some Jewish music or something and just being absolutely ecstatic, you know. Mm. Um, and then 
And then we used to have like a Magnavox console, you know, the kind of thing where you stack six records and it would drop them down. You're right. And I used to listen. I used to listen to uh, Bach. Uh, Bach who would give me tingles up and down my spine. You know, I'm sure many people had that kind of experience. Mm. Um, and, and then when I was in high school, uh, my friend Danny Conrad had a, a third floor all to himself, his bedroom. So it was like away from parents. And we used to go up there and smoke a little pot and listen to jazz. And one day he put on Ravi Shankar and Alaraka. And it was like, oh, it was like game set match i just heard that it was like instant recognition for me so mm. i was i just had to pursue it and um um i went to um i went to antioch college and they had this um work study program so you'd you know you'd be on campus for oh maybe um you know, three months or six months and then you'd go out and do a job somewhere and i had a job in new york city hold on a second i gotta drink some more I think this was the, yeah, it was my first, my first uh, job. So it was, must've been like 65. Cause I went, I went to college like in the summer, right after I graduated, like in August, I think I started right away. Um, but I worked for this company in uh, this architectural firm in New York city that, um, that built the Pan Am building anyway. So one day I saw um, an ad in the paper for a sitar concert at the United Nations. And I went and there was a you know, small hall at the United Nations and this painter named Om Prakash uh, <clears throat> uh, was giving a concert. And afterwards I went up to him and I said, hey, you know, can you teach me? And he said, well, do you have a sitar? I said, no. He said, well, I can probably, you know, one of my students can probably lend you one. Um, I think I ended up buying it and um, I took lessons from him. Now, one day I, I showed up for a lesson and he said, oh, did we have a lesson today? I said, yeah. He said, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. He said, listen, I'm, I'm going up. I think it was Stony Point. He said, I'm going to go meet John Cage. You want to come? And I said, sure. So we drove up uh, to the college and I guess a professor who lived off campus um, had John Cage there. So we hung out and played poker and he didn't say much, but uh, smiled a lot. Anyway, so um, then um, I heard about the uh, American Society for Eastern Arts. Mm. Um, uh, Louise Scripps was, you know, one of the heirs to the Scripps Howard newspaper fortune, and she was a student of Bala Saraswati, the great South Indian dance, uh, uh, you know, maybe the greatest dancer of her generation. And her brothers were these absolute superlative South Indian musicians, Vishwanathan and Ranganathan. I'm pretty sure they were her brothers. So she came from this fantastic uh, musical family. Uh, anyway, so she sponsored this group called the American Society for Eastern Arts. And they were going to have uh, in the summer of 66, I think it was, Ali Akbar Khan and Nikhil Banerjee. So I, I wrote to Nikhil Banerjee and I said, I want to come study with you in India. And he said, well, why don't you come meet me in California first? And I, of course, I, I was going to do that. And <clears throat> the morning I met him, there, they had put on an event um, that was like, a, I think it was like an all day concert. And they had South Indian musicians. They had North Indian musicians, Ali Akbar Khan, Nikhil Banerjee um, and um, Oh God, what's his name? Tabla player. I'll think of it. Um, anyway, uh, shoot. Um, they had, uh, I don't know if I said they had Japanese musicians as well. And Suzuki Roshi gave a talk. So the first day that I saw Nikhil Banerjee was the same day that I first saw Suzuki Roshi. I don't know if you were aware of that event or remembered such what, an event. What, when was it? Well, it, it must, it was, uh, that was in the summer of 67, I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I ended up studying. Um, yeah, can, can you describe, tell me everything you know about that event so I, I can, you know, maybe find it. I, it does ring a bell. Uh, I wasn't there. I was well, at Tassahara. Oh, you were at Tassahara maybe at the time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so uh, 
Yeah, it was the summer of 67. I was still in college. Um, but what and, sort of event um, was it? It was, if, yeah, if he went there, there was some, what was the overall, you were saying it's an all day. Yeah, it was like an all-day concert um, with all these different musicians from, uh, you know, different parts of the world um, that the American Society for Eastern Arts was sponsoring. And I guess they had, you know, I, at least this is my memory, you know, maybe it's a long time ago, <laughs> but I distinctly remember seeing Suzuki Roshi give a talk there. Um, and it makes kind of sense. Uh, those kind of events, you know, were more all encompassing in free form in those days. Mm -hmm. I think we were, you know, so, um, wow. And, of, and, and of course, you know, uh, it was, uh, Nikhil Banerjee played a morning raga and it just brought me to tears. I mean, I'd never heard anything like that. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think there's ever been another sitar player that, that could do what he did, uh, both, you know, in terms of, um, uh, just the, the sheer, uh, a spiritual and emotional connection with the music coupled with the most amazing pyrotechnics, you know, you could imagine. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, they both had the same teacher, he and Ravi Shankar and Ali Akbar Khan's, it was Ali Akbar Khan's father that was their teacher. So, oh. so that was kind of, that was kind of my, um, you know, I, w I was so, uh, how to say it, you know that album by George Harrison called Wonderwall? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've heard it. It's way back there in the past. So, you know, it, it, the cover uh, is, you see, on one side of a wall, you're like in this drab Liverpool street. You know, it's there's nothing growing. It's just drab bricks and sidewalk or whatever. And on the other side of the wall are all these, you know, these these gopis and, and peacocks and, and musicians, and it's all very colorful and, and, you know, a scene. And I felt like I had left that cold world and come into this wonderful, magical place um, that summer studying. And then when it was over, um, you know, I felt somewhat bereft and wasn't sure how to proceed. I mean, I kept practicing, but I went back to school and the Vietnam War was going on. And, you know, I think I was pretty... You know, traumatized by the the prospect of um, of the draft, you know, as one thing, and um, just kind of recovering in a sense from my own uh, childhood. I had an older brother who was mentally ill, so that that had took a kind of a toll on our family. Mm. Um, and and so um, when I went to India in uh, later on that year, I arranged for a year abroad in India. Normally when you do a year abroad as a student, they send you to a program. Like you'll go to Benares and you'll learn Hindi and you'll immerse in the culture and you'll have classes. And, and um, for some reason, Antioch decided to allow me to have a ticket to go to India on my own. So, um, but I ended up in India um, before Nikhil Banerjee uh, came. Uh, he was still touring Europe. So I wasn't sure what to do. And I, I, I was in Calcutta and I went to the Ali Akbar College there and I met uh, Annapurna Devi, who was uh, Ravi Shankar's wife, Ali Akbar Khan's sister. Um, and she's she was really, after her father died, she was like the guru, you know. Um, mm. Nikhil, Nikhil Banerjee said, you know, of, of all of Alauddin Khan's students, Annapurna Devi absorbed 100%, uh, uh, Ali Akbar Khan 75%, Ravi Shankar 25%, and he said he absorbed 10% or something. I mean, he's being modest. Right. Um, uh, but, um, I was, I just felt a, a strong connection, a strong pull to study with her and, so I ended up going to Bombay and, and studying with her for a while. But I, I found the circumstance just too physically difficult to sustain. I, I had, was living with a family in a room in a suburb, three train rides away from Malabar Hill, where she lived. Um, you know, that's a fancy section of Bombay. And at the time, it, it said Ravi Shankar on, on her 
on her door. She, they later divorced and he married someone else. And she gave amazing lessons. You know, her lessons were foundational. There, there was, you know, it was, it's hard to describe, but everything that she taught was, uh, would lead to, you know, further development. Mm. So, um, so I felt, you know, I, I, I had to leave. I couldn't stay. It was, it was just unsustainable for me psychologically. So uh, I left, uh, you know, feeling a little bit um, broken uh, that I couldn't sustain it. And I went traveling and um, I met a, a young American uh, sadhu type on, on the boat from Bombay to Goa. And, hmm. um, and he kind of, um, you know, I, I, he inspired me and I, I asked him, you know, what ashrams and gurus, you know, I might go check in with. And um, he gave me some different places. And so I went and spent some time in Goa on the beach. I stayed in the house with a bunch of German hippies who were, they were smuggling hashish into, um, into Europe, into Germany, what they did was they would take these slabs of hashish and they would coat them with many coats of varnish. And one of them was a very accomplished painter. So he would paint uh, uh, Russian icons on these slabs of hashish and they were beautiful. I mean, they looked just absolutely amazing. So I, <clears throat> I guess they, they imported them into Germany as um, uh, pieces of art. And I remember waking up, someone nudging me and handing me a chalum, you know. <laughs> I mean, you start the day on the beach in Goa with a with a chalum full of hashish. You're going to you're going to go into a whiteout mode anyway. So um, <laughs> that didn't that didn't last too long. And I went traveling and, and I went down to Kerala and stayed in a game preserve, which was amazing and, and saw, you know, beautiful game um, different animals there and and then oh, took the bus over to um, what animals time. what animals i saw um well we saw elephants uh we didn't see any tigers i remember when we went to stay in the uh, cabin in the middle of this forest there was a moat dug all the way around it and the bridge across was log well like uh you might say like um maybe 12 by 12s or 10 by 10s that were, uh, you know, flat and then spaced uh, so that you had to kind of walk over the spaces. It wasn't a continuous path because that was to keep the animals and the elephants from going over. Um, it was amazing uh, being in that room mm -hmm. with the bars on the windows and the windows open and hearing the jungle sounds at night. It was just amazing. Um, and then one night we, uh, I was with a Swiss couple that I'd met and we went up and stayed in a, an observation tower overnight. And we looked out and looked out and looked out and saw nothing. There was like a, a, a meadow, um, below us. And then just as we were about to give up, um, I saw the head of a, a kind of an ox, kind of a wild ox, um, emerge from the the the, uh, the forest into this open area and there he was followed by four males and then followed again by maybe 20 females that were flanked on either side by other males and then males bringing up the back and I guess there were some young ones so that was very dramatic um, and we saw elephants I don't think we saw much else, but it was that was amazing. So then we we took a, a bus over to um, Madras. You know, Carol is on the west coast, and it gets all the rain, and it's absolutely green. And then you go over the mountains into Madras State, and it's dry. And I went to this temple. Madras is Mod Chennai, right? Chennai, yeah, uh, uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so uh, went to a temple town and hung out there for a while. And then went What's to the name of the temple town? Madurai. Uh-huh. M-A-D-U-R-A-I. They're famous for these towers on the, on the temple called Gopuram. And, and the, the towers are covered with, uh, you know, sculptors of, of, you know, gods and beings and so on and all painted in bright beautiful colors mm. and that was that was that was very that was exceptional being there you know and you went into the temple and they had this long corridor i remember you start at 
at the corridor and, you know, you go in from the outside and already the sound has changed. And when you walk halfway down this corridor that feels like it's carved out of stone, the, the sound, uh, there's a kind of reverberation in there like nothing I've ever heard. It was really spectacular. Mm. I, you, and then I went did to... You, wait a minute. Uh, did you go to uh, Terry Wanamaly? No, I didn't. Mm. All right. But then, then I went to the Aurobindo ashram. Yeah. Yeah. So w when I got to the Aurobindo ashram, I was actually, uh, you had to apply to be admitted. And I, I had a fever and I had to stay in a hotel room for a couple of days and recover from my fever. And then they, they uh, accepted me and I came in. And of course, it was very beautiful inside. They had this memorial, like a huge slab of marble that was covered with fresh flowers every day. It was very fragrant and beautiful mm. and everything was clean. It was like an oasis from India because India is a difficult place. If you've been there, it's uh -huh. not necessarily easy, easy to be in India. And, um, so I went into this, the library there and, um, I was talking with a librarian. I remember he told me that he had been diagnosed with cancer like 11 years ago and given a few months to live. And so he decided to come to India and he'd been there ever since. And he, he asked me about me and I said, well, I, you know, I'd been studying music. Um, I had studied in Bombay, but you know, it was difficult for me to stay there. And, um, he got this faraway look in his eyes and, and, he, and he, he, he said, you know, come with me. And he sat me down at a table with a woolen sack tape recorder and some headphones. And he said, listen to this. So he put on uh, a raga by Ali Akbar Khan. And I was overcome with some kind of extremely powerful experience. Um, you know, they say that, um, uh, uh, at the time, the mother was still alive. If you know about Aurobindo Ashram, there was Aurobindo and his consort, the mother, who was a French woman who who became uh, like a, a co-guru, if you will. She mm -hmm. was still alive at the time. And there were stories about people who get off the train at Pondicherry having no idea that there was even an ashram there and and, and you know and, and and feel the energy immediately when she showed up the story goes she saw this pillar of light she just went as a french citizen to the colony you know to 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 be there and she saw this pillar of light and she followed uh, it to sri aurobindo and right. that's how she found him and the colony Pondi was pondicherry pondicherry correct right yeah. so so i had this tremendously powerful experience and i i felt you know, almost enlightened for, you know, it kind of lasted for a couple of weeks. And then I, um, I had a private audition with her or audition or, or Darshan or whatever. Darshan, I think is the right word. And I just remember her eyes were these sparkling blue kaleidoscopic eyes. And um, she didn't say anything, but I, I certainly felt something. Mm. So then I came back and that, had such a profound effect on me that experience that I, I felt the need to, uh, you know, find some spiritual practice, some meditation practice. And that's when I started, when I went back, when I started sitting with those folks in Yellow Springs, Ohio. So, um, mm. and I continue, I, I did go back to study uh, with Nikhil Banerjee, I think in it was in 69, the summer of 69. And then in the summer of 70 is when I came to Zen Center. Um, and Hey, remind point, me who you were sitting with in Yellow Springs. I forgot. Yeah, there, it was um, um, an, an older couple. I mean, I was, you know, I was, I guess I was in, I was 20 or something at the time by then. Um and um, they lived in a geodesic dome in the woods. Uh, um, I think it was called Glen Ellen in the woods. And they and they sat every Wednesday night. They were students of Yasutani Roshi. Mm. So right. I came to Zen Center and I had my sitar and I played, practiced my sitar at Zen Center. And um, then um, <clears throat> um, Baker Roshi sent me to be with... Um, Nancy Wilson Ross Young. So I spent the summer 
with her at um, in the Adirondacks, and um, but that, that was that also was summer. what year? Gosh, uh, maybe seventy two. I don't remember exactly, to be honest. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, uh, Baker Roshi found out that that Nikhil Banerjee was also teaching and he asked me, did I want to, uh, and you know, not go, I think, I think he asked me if I wanted to return and study. And I said, no, it was, it was fine. I, I spent the summer there. So, um, but then fast forward, you know, to the time when it came time that I left a Zen center, I definitely wanted to continue pursuing music. Um, but, you know, I had to earn a living, so I, I worked as a carpenter, and I I studied guitar for a while. Um, I don't think that I took any sitar classes or anything then. Um, what type of guitar did you study? Um, you know, I... I studied a little bit of jazz guitar and I had a wonderful a Martin a D18 for a while, it had a beautiful sound. And I did a lot of improvising and I did a lot of kind of pseudo Indian raga type things on it and just things that I made up, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at a certain point, um, I had always felt that I was lacking in, in my, my rhythmic understanding. So I started studying with, uh, Zakir Hussain. Um, and I studied. What were you him. studying? Oh, so Zakir Hussain is a tabla player. Mm-hmm. He's probably the, the most famous tabla player, um, alive. You know, he played, he plays with Shakti, you know, with John McLaughlin. Um, and he's played, he's played with Chris Potter, the, the sax player. Uh, he played with Bela Fleck. I mean, he's played with everybody. You know, he's, he's very versatile and an amazing, amazing percussionist and extremely generous teacher. So I, I played tablas for, I don't know, 30 years or something. And then um, I just had this, I, I had a desire to play melody again. It was like, oh, I, I just need to play some notes. And and so um, I had played the five string banjo. I, I, I should go back. You know, when when I was when I was a kid, I studied the trumpet. That was my first love. And then the next one was was the five string banjo. And then uh-huh. then came the sitar. So um, I decided I wanted to study banjo again. And I started working on it and practicing really hard and um, uh, trying to learn some jazzy things like Bela Fleck did and and. At, but at a certain point, um, one day I was practicing and my hand hurt. And I thought, oh, I better take a break. What age? Oh, about 65, 66, something like like that. Maybe 66. Um, I had been playing for six and, years. And, and how old are you now? 75. Yeah, all right. So nine years so, ago. Yeah. So, so uh, I thought, okay, I'll take a few days break. And, um, I did and came back and it still hurt. So I said, well, I better take a couple of weeks and same thing. I came back after a couple of weeks. I said, well, I better give it a month or so. And yeah. each time I came back, you know, my hands hurt too much. Um, and so I just had to stop. Um, mm. you know, I've got, I've got a triple whammy. I've got trigger finger and I've got, Arthritis and some carpal tunnel. I mean, I've got it all. So, what, what did you say? Uh, one finger, trigger finger. Tri- yeah, have you heard of that trigger finger? No. So that's that's a condition where uh, it's pretty common. It, the fingers have you know tendons that that run all the way you know from the I guess from the somewhere in the palm or or, or even further up all the way up through the finger and and they go through. Uh, these uh, rings that keep them in place called they call them pulleys and with age the the tendons actually accumulate some material they get thicker and um, it happens to everyone but but some people it gets thick enough that the tendon has a hard time going through the pulley and it gets caught so you know you may say make a fist 
and then you try to open it and the finger might snap back. You might feel the snapping and it can be painful. And, mm. um, and I know that um, uh, um, David Silva had Deputrens, which is another uh, uh, thing that happens to your finger where it kind of, I think it kind of gets stuck in a position. So um, I had an operation and, you know, my hands work well enough, but not well enough to play an instrument. So uh, I thought, well, what can I do now? <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. a lifetime of being a music student, uh, an instrumentalist. And I thought, well, what's left is I can learn to sing. Only I'm not gifted with a nice voice. <clears throat> and um, so, but I, I asked a friend if he knew of a, a, a good classical Indian teacher, and he did know of one who lives over in the East Bay. Um, and I started taking some lessons with her. Her name is Jayanti Saha Surabude. And her mother-in-law was a, a very famous and wonderful uh, singer from the Gwalior uh, Garana. Not that that means a whole lot. You know, there's different schools, different. They have each one has more or less of a distinctive style. Um, <clears throat> so I started taking lessons with her. And since my wife is a vocalist, she she helped has helped me, you know, with techniques. Some, I don't take enough advantage of what she has to offer. Really. I should work with her more. She's a great teacher. Um, but I've been working on it now for a number of years. And I have to say, uh, I'm starting to sing in tune. <laughs> uh -huh. Now what, what type of music are you singing? So, um, you know, I do I, I do from time to time practice some popular songs, but mostly I'm working on on classical North Indian uh, vocal music. Which North Indian. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. So that that requires that I, um, you know, it requires a whole lot of skills that are extremely refined. I mean, for one thing you have to be very precisely in tune. If you're not in tune, it, it loses. The raga is, you know, can be destroyed if, you, if you're out of tune enough. Of course, that's true of any music, but it's particularly, um, it's a particular requirement. You just have to be in tune. Then the other thing you have to be able to do is to slide smoothly between notes and intervals. So um, that means a continuous tone from the center of one pitch to the center of the other pitch and maybe back down again. And you make these very kind of circular movements uh, with, with the notes that are all connected in a way. Mm -hmm. So the technique is very, very difficult. And since, you know, since I'm not, like I say, not naturally gifted as a singer, I've had to approach this kind of mechanically and figure out well, what the heck is this mechanism all about and what makes it work? And it's it's been an uphill uh, battle, but um, there is progress. <laughs> well, could, can you uh, give me an example? An example? Well, <clears throat> I'm not prepared to sing right now, but I could direct you to some, you know, some wonderful, um, uh you know, wonderful singers that you could listen to and, and get a sense of what that music is about, get a really okay. uh, authentic sense of that. I'll send you some links to, yeah. to different people. Chicken. Um, You're a chicken. I just wanted to I'm hear you go from one note to another. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Oh, gosh. Um, <clears throat> hang on a second. <laughs> You're putting me on the spot. I have to go grab something. I'll be right back. All right. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it takes me about an hour to warm up. Oh, wow. I, mean, I, ha I, I, I have sung today, but I'm not... <clears throat> not in any shape right now <clears throat> let's see if i can even pull this off um hmm. uh, 
<laughs> Just give me a second. I got to warm up a little. All right. <laughs> composition we've been working on that's great that's great you did a good job i I really appreciate it um and i really am impressed at your um fine-tuning uh of what you do with music you know i've been involved with music all my life and i'm the opposite uh and and you're really um uh you know, like I say, fine tuning is is what I think of, and uh, perfectionism. And you do it in your your audio work too. You know, I was looking at your website, the Lotus Group USA, uh, and uh, you know, read reviews of your equipment and saw that uh, article on what the Beatnik audio file or something. Uh, about going and, and, and I I put a link to it on the podcast, uh, uh, and and you're uh, you're really into very high end, not only uh, listening but very very the highest end listening, uh, uh, but in the uh, high end uh, playing of the sitar, uh, in, no matter how little guitar you you did. I remember you as being a very good guitar player who did Mm. unusual type of guitar, uh, which I was interested Mm. in and I thought it was really neat. And, and you're singing, you're doing the same thing. You're, uh, you're dissatisfied in the lower realms. (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, um, I mean, music is a a form of yoga, you know, and and I think, you know, the Indians certainly view it that way. I mean, my singing is nowhere near good enough, nor will it ever be to be a professional Indian singer that, you know, uh, I have very little hope of that, of anything like that happening, especially at this age. Maybe if I'd started, you know, when I was 20 or or five. (laughs) Yeah, you're doing it as a practice. It Yeah. And and it. You know, even to just be able to get closer to the pitch, to get closer to the feel of the raga, um, you know, that's that's a, that's a lot of uh, satisfaction. And I, it, it, I don't know how to be any other way anyhow, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, other than mm-hmm. always working on it. It just seems to be that I have to do that. I'm, you know, either driven or whatever, but... Um, but if I make a little progress, I'm very happy. I'm happy with a little progress. Mm-hmm. You don't have absolute pitch, do you? Oh, no. No, not yeah. at all. I think well, of that but, as a curse. Yeah, probably. In, in some ways, yeah, it it might be. Um, I'm, you know, I'm just, you heard the Tanpur. I played the uh, electronic Tanpur, the drone. Uh-huh. And, you know, that's, you know, that's the absolute reference. Yeah. And so um and also you probably you may or may not do you know about just intonation? Do you know what that is? Say it again, just 
just intonation as opposed to tempered intonation. Right, Bach, it's tempered, and and, and no, I'd like to hear. Okay, so um, <clears throat> in order, um, this was something that was figured out, you know, I guess around Bach's time, um, that in order to be able to transpose from any key to any other key and have all the intervals, all the relationships between all the intervals be the same, you had to actually detune the instrument, um, you know, the keyboard, um, slightly as a compromise so that those intervals would all be the same. And what detuning means is that you know, the, the, all of the notes that we have in a chromatic scale in some sense can be de derived from the physics of a string. So, you know, when you play a harmonic at the 12th fret of your guitar, that's an octave. If you play it at the, uh, I think at the seventh fret, it, what is it? A fifth and at the fifth fret, it's another, whatever those are. Well, you can, you can extrapolate finer and finer, um, uh, overtones, which are actual divisions of the string. So when you when you put your finger on on the node of the, the 12th string, the the string is actually divided in half. So if you look at if you look at the string What's a node? Uh, well, it's just the that point, okay? Yeah. So the octave is the string divided in half. And the fifth, I'm not sure, I think it might be the string divided in in um in thirds and and the string divided in fourths and and fifths and sixths and those are actual physical like sine wave like divisions you can actually see them in the way that a string uh vibrates you know you can mm -hmm. you can you can film it or whatever and so those are perfect intervals that are something that exists in the in the physics of a string that we can derive all the notes from. So Indian music is based on that intonation. So all those intervals are perfect intervals, but they don't transpose in the way that we do. They don't, you know, you can't, you can't go from, uh, you, you can't transpose a raga from uh, starting from another note, in other words, if that makes sense. Because that's what, you know, transposing is, you know, you play a major scale from C, you play a major scale from D, you play a major scale from F sharp. They're all the same. Um, uh, they all have all the same intervallic or proportional relationships. Mm. So Indian music is based on this just intonation. And that's why the drone is there. That gives the absolute reference. And there's something, um, you know, uh, an accomplished singer can can rest on 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 any of those notes um, without without losing the pitch, without wavering. Of course, we have that in, in Western music, but there's many different degrees of, of vibrato that people employ, you know, some which goes way out of the range of the note and some which stay very close to the note. Um, but Indian music, you, your, your effort is to try and have it be as smooth and even as possible. So there's all these very, you know, impossible to achieve requirements. <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah. Now, is there uh, what Western music uh, is uh, just tuning? Well, I mean, there are Western there are Western musicians who've made compositions in just intonation, and I th I personally think that when you hear like if you hear a bluegrass group where 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 they're singing really really perfectly in tune, I think they may be segueing over to uh, just intonation in some kind of sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's there's just something that that's very penetrating about being having that kind of intonation, mm -hmm. and you know, the 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 Indian music is is very scientific. You know, they they divided the octave into 66 increments that are discernible by the human ear. Um, mm -hmm. Now they use all, they use very similar. They have the chromatic increments that we have, but they also have microtones and microtones can be like a little bit of a wavering. Sometimes that's intentional. Um, and they also have figured out that if you take, if you take a scale that has, 
seven notes ascending and seven notes descending, and the, the, there is a first and a fifth, those, those being sixth. Um, but you have <clears throat> all the variations of all the other notes. In other words, okay, all of the scales that have a flatted second in them, uh, all of the scales that have an augmented fourth in them and so on, they figured out there's 72 of those. And you could you could ex extrapolate it for yourself. You know, there's 70. They call them Mela Carta ragas. So those are the basic ragas that have seven notes ascending and the same seven notes descending. And then there are ragas that skip a note, like the one that I just uh, attempted to sing, uh, skips the third. It goes from the second to the fourth, and then again it goes from the fifth to the flatted third. Uh, I'm sorry, fifth to the flatted seventh, or the fifth to the major seventh, depending on on the how you're traveling through the raga. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there are ragas that have built-in zigzags. You have to go, in order to go down a certain way, you have to go up first. You know, So there's all these different kind of very um, uh, configurations that are, that, are, that are given that define a raga. You can have a raga that has two different ragas that have exactly the same scale, but one of them will emphasize the third and the other will emphasize the sixth, and they'll have different approaches and they'll have a different feel. They might be associated with a different season or a different time of day. So they're very scientific about all that kind of thing. Mm. Wow. Impressive. Yeah. And and I'd like to talk about, since you brought it up, I'd like to talk a little bit about hi-fi because that's yeah, that's something that um, uh, it, it's that's something that happened to me also when I was in my twenties living in Berkeley. I wandered into a store, and they had this very esoteric, these very esoteric speakers and amplifiers at the time, and um, boy, that impressed the heck out of me. And then uh, one of my friends, one of my fellow students of Indian music was a guy named Mark Levinson. You may have heard of him. Uh, he was at one time married to Kim Cattrall, the actress. Um, and he had a, <clears throat> he started, he was one of the original high end guys, um, you know, after the, 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 what are the Dynakits and Dynakos, you know, uh, um, of the of the what 50s and 60s maybe he he came out with a preamp that was like twelve hundred dollars unheard of that much money for a preamp now you can spend a, now you can spend a hundred thousand dollars for a preamp um and i know it's crazy um so i kind of wait, wait a minute what is because, what's because, the difference between a preamp and an amp so, um, amplifier, a preamplifier and an amplifier. So in, in one sense, the preamplifier is the heart of the system. It's the control center. So, you, you know, typically they'll have uh, multiple inputs. So you could input, input a CD player, a, a tape player and a turntable, let's say. Mm -hmm. And it has a volume control, but it doesn't usually have enough power to drive a loudspeaker so you have to take the output signal of the preamplifier and then route it to an amplifier which does provide enough power to drive the speakers well we used to call what about what we we called receivers so a receiver is basically an all-in-one device that had a tuner you know, a radio receiver and a an amplifier and a preamplifier. It had all the controls, but it, you could just attach the speakers to the back of it because it had a built-in amplifier. So that that's what a receiver is. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in high-end audio, people are really into separates. There are some high-end integrated amplifiers that have a preamp and amp built in and sometimes even a, even a, a, a digital to analog decoder. Um, but very, very high end stuff, you have separates. So, you know, an extreme case of separates would be not only do you have a separate amplifier, but you have a separate amplifier for each channel. And then the next more extreme set would be <laughs> to have a separate power supply for, um, uh, for each channel, for each amplifier. And, um, I had a customer who, um, had a pair of, um, 
amplifiers from Japan from a company called Wavac that had three chassis. It had it had a power filter and a power supply and then the the, the audio circuitry in three separate boxes. And that was like a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar tube amplifier. Um so Whoa. you know this oh. <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. it's another universe. Wow. But, but here's 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 the here's the catch though. You can spend a lot of money and in my estimation not get great sound. Yeah. Um, there there has to be the right kind of synergy and and the right things happening to allow the best of the sound to come through. Um, you know, there's many different approaches. I have my own approach. You know, I design cables and 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 uh, power line accessories and some isolation devices and things like that. And uh, you know, you get to a certain level of resolution in in a system. Smaller and smaller improvements become more and more apparent. I mean, it's kind of crazy. Um, I had this thing happen to me um, in the last month. I went to order some capacitors that I use in a device that I build. And um, that value is no longer available from that manufacturer. So, you know, at first I was like, oh, what am I going to do? But it turned into an opportunity. I actually got to... Uh, to test um, other brands and, and found things that sounded better. And basically what I was listening to was uh, this ground plane device that I had uh, created. It's a, it's basically a plate of pure silver with uh, a number of layers of insulating uh, and noise absorbing materials around it. And then I tune it with a capacitor to allow the high frequencies to, to kind of blossom. What's a capacitor? And, <clears throat> Okay. A capacitor is a device that stores and releases energy. This is, this is, you know, my understanding. I'm not an engineer, but I, you know, I have folklore knowledge about audio, you might say. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they're used in, in, in circuits. Um, They, they can be used to, um, uh, you know, to, to isolate, um, and and like I say, to to store and release energy, um, and you can couple different stages of an amplifier using uh, a capacitor. So, you know, the output of a of a of a tube could be coupled to its out it, the, the output that, that would then go to the speaker cable with a capacitor. That's one way to do it. You say it stores energy. Does that mean it has the function of a battery? No, it's not a battery. I mean, it's it's basically um, so a typical film capacitor is basically you have um, you have uh, um, windings of uh, let's say copper foil that are interleaved with uh, a layer of paper or polypropylene or something like that or mica. Uh, although that's not a film capacitor and mica capacitor, but the, you know, you have layers that separate uh, the, the layers of metal that, that uh, insulate them and they can be, they're wound, you know, so these two things are wound together uh, on a bobbin uh, to a certain um, size and then a certain value. They can, they can uh, handle so much current, you know, and they can, um, and they have a, a certain value. So there's some that are huge and there's some that are small. But I'm not really the guy to give an education about capacitors. I mean, it's, you know, it's deeper than what I'm saying. Mm. Um, so I had to, I created this device, which basically is, uh, you know, in its simple, simplest form, it's a hunk of silver that that's attached to a wire um, that, um attaches to the ground post on my preamplifier. So what's amazing to me is that, first of all, just hooking that up to my preamplifier changes the sound of my system. And listening to different brands of capacitors, different levels of quality, I can hear that. I can hear that when I drop the needle, I'm standing behind the speaker. I can hear that before I go and stand in front of the speaker. 
So all this is a very roundabout way of saying that it's possible to have an effect on a, a, a system if, if everything is really well put together to extract more and more and more and more sound and information out of what's in the grooves or what's in the CD pits or what's in the file. You can, you can hear more of the shimmer on this symbol. You can hear more of the solidity when it's struck in the center. You can hear more of the, um, you know, how the sound travels across the membrane of a drum. Uh, you can hear uh, the, the, the minute adjustments in, in, the, in the embouchure of the trumpet player and his lips. You know, all of these things. You can hear the exact position uh, of the instrument in relation to the microphone um, and, and, how, and how that particular sound is in the hall. So in, in the very best sense, uh, in, in really great system, sound becomes three-dimensional. Yeah. Sound transcends the speakers and, and fills the room in a way that gives you this illusion of being at the event. Well, what about it's the uh, speaker setup, uh, stereo, quadraphonic, or whatever? So, I mean... Um, it's amazing how much information is in a stereo recording. You know, there are these, uh, I guess the latest uh, thing is like Dolby Atmos. Mm -hmm. So Dolby Atmos uh, systems have speakers that also have speaker drivers that are kind of aimed up at an angle towards the ceiling um, to create, I guess, some, you know, reverberant or ambient um information or to capture that in some kind of way. Um, but um, for purists, uh, two channels is enough. That is good to hear. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, what happens for me is I, I, I'll think that this, this reference system of mine, which is one of the best systems I've heard, not that I've heard everything, but it's, it's really got something special going on. What's amazing to me is it will get to a certain plateau and then I'll figure out that something else that I can do to squeeze just another little bit out of it. And it's catapulted to another level, you know, that I couldn't have predicted that I, that I wouldn't have known that it would, it would become mm. or it would go to, you know, mm. how are your ears? So, <laughs> well, you know, in objective sense, I haven't had the, my, my hearing measured. I'm sure that I have a dropout. Um, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm 75. So, um, and if I listen really loud, like I did today, I'll have a little bit of, uh, a little, I don't know, like a little very faint hiss that I can hear. You know, I know that I'm probably not being as kind to my ears as I should. Yeah. Um, but um, but what I hear, you know, it's just it's just uh, amazing, and it's 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 very it, it's kind of viscerally satisfying. Mm. You know. Um, mm. So. Wow. Yeah, that's a whole other thing. It's a whole other thing. But you know. Um, I was I was pretty happy uh, as a Zen student listening to the creek. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you remember Lou Harrison? Of course, yeah. Uh, well, I got to know him, uh, and uh, you know he'd come to Tassar as a guest, and uh, he said, uh, you know, I apologized to him that we didn't uh, uh, allowed uh, we didn't have music. Um, actually, people could have an instrument and take it down creek or up creek, but we didn't have it there. And he said, you have all the music you need here. You know, you have the creek, you have the bells, you have the wooden sound, uh, a lot of space between them. And uh, yeah. yeah, anyway, I never forgot that. Yeah, yes. Now, you. No. when did you meet your wife? How long have you all been together? 30 years. And uh, you uh, tell me about, uh, you, you said she's a jazz singer. Yeah. Hmm. 
Cool. Uh, tell me about it. So um, her father was a, a principal violinist in the San Francisco Symphony. Ah. Um, so um, un- he started under Montu, who wanted him to be a, a, a solo artist. He wanted him to have a solo career, but uh, his name was Irvin Mountner, but he didn't want to travel and leave his family. So he, he stayed with the symphony. So she grew up, you know, with uh, people coming to dinner like Seiji Azawa and, um, um, you know, other great musicians and um, her father having string quartet uh, rehearsals in the house and, you know, that sort of thing. So Mm -hmm. she played piano and she sang um, motets uh, in school and her father wanted her to be a classical singer uh, and have a career um, maybe in the opera or the symphony, um, which would have been a smart move (laughs) in retrospect. (laughs) But, uh, you know, having said that, you know, one day she heard jazz on the radio and for her, it was kind of all over, you know, she just had to, had to, had had to learn that. And she, um, uh, she studied from, uh, with, um, I'm trying to, why am I blanking right now? I'll think of it. Um, local Mill Valley singers, really great singer. Um, I can't think of her name. Uh, anyway, um, and she also learned from Bobby McFerrin and from Mark Murphy, who Mark Murphy was a great, great jazz singer. Um, and so she played around the Bay Area quite a lot. Um, she especially loves Brazilian uh, jazz, but, you know, she's played many, many different genres. You know, she can sing R&B, she can sing pop, you know, um, she can sing fusion jazz, she can sing straight ahead jazz. She can, she doesn't do it, but she can sing classical music. Um, and she's also a vocal coach. She's a very, uh, very, very good teacher. I mean, she's, her, her students love her and she's got a couple of kids that are coming along that look pretty promising. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I think I told you she toured with Dan Hicks for 10 years. He, uh, Oh, right. I, I knew somebody, yeah. you know, I was trying to remember recently who told me that. Well, that's very impressive. Uh, I love Dan Hicks. Mm. Yeah. Dan was amazing. Yeah. You know, I got, I got to spend time with him and I, I I don't know how many of those concerts I heard. He went after her um, uh, some years before she actually joined. He he tried to entice. She said she'd heard he was a bad boy and she didn't want to. And she didn't want to go touring. But um, but this friend of hers was singing with him, and the other singer dropped out. And she said, "Look, why don't you just come over and you know come over to his house, sing a, a couple of songs, you know, and and you don't have to commit to anything." So she, you know, she went over and she sang one song, and he said, he just looked at her and he said, well, "You want to be in the band?" And she said, "Oh, okay." <laughs> oh, that's great. And, that's and great. That, that was that, and. Um, you know, he, he was a bad boy, but, you know, he was much reformed bad boy by the time she, she got in the band. You know, he he wrote a, um, a a memoir before he died, you know, and he talks about his, I think, 12 years of, of you know, being an alcoholic. Uh, he, he burned a lot of bridges. You know, he could have been a lot more famous than he was, and he certainly has um, – a catalog of songs, which his wife is, which I think they sold before he died. You know, I'm sure that they, they got quite a lot of money for it. But, oh yeah. You know, I mean, he wrote, he wrote so many great songs, you know, probably the most famous is I scare myself. Uh, how right, I, right. And how can I miss you when you won't go away? Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. Uh, so <laughs> many, and you know, and he was, he was a student of Americana, you know, I mean, he loved um, he loved jazz, and he he would play in a separate little band um, that he called Bayside Jazz, and he would play over at the sweet the old Sweetwater. He would do little jazz jazz gigs there, um, mm. and you know he sang uh, 
He sang Tom Wills. Uh, he sang, I mean, you name it. If it was Americana or if he liked it, it was in the repertoire. And he would he would put on different themed shows, like he put on a food themed show, or he put on a um, uh, oh god, who was the the famous stride pianist? Um, oh god, I'm blanking. This is what happens when you're my age, right? Aphasia. Um, it's called aphasia. Uh, yeah. Um, who's the famous? Yes. Uh, who was the great stride pianist? I checked it out here. Uh, the man, James P. Johnson, the man generally credited as the father of stride piano. Born in New Jersey in 1894, Grew up in New York City, and like many other pianists of his time, he was heavily influenced by the piano rags of Scott Joplin. Anyway, they they put on all these different uh, shows with different themes. One was called the College of Musical Knowledge. He was always coming up with stuff, and he was an artist. He painted he painted backdrops that they used. He you know had a, a special backdrop for a Christmas show. They did all these mm. Christmas tunes. You know, it was it was fun. It was always fun. He would tell the same jokes over and over again, but in different ways. I always laughed. He always got me. He was funny. He oh. was very funny. Uh. Yeah, uh. that was great. That was a great experience. Ah, uh. wow. And hmm. Uh, just uh, one second. I'm up here. Uh, hmm. Well, Joe, you did it. Uh, <laughs> you you talked enough about music for it to be a separate podcast. We're we're over an hour. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's great. Um. Hmm. You know what we're going. You know who who uh, Tom uh, Moore is. Thomas Moore wrote "Care of the Soul" and. Uh, soulmates and many uh, books like that. Well, if you know or not, his... I'm not, I'm not sure if I am, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, um, he, he, he told me his daughter is singing tonight here in uh, oh. Bali. So we're uh, going over to a booth and we're going to go up to a 7 to 9 p.m. concert. His daughter is uh, Ajit, A-J-E-E-T, uh, and she's really big in Europe. It's sort of uh, new age music. Uh, uh-huh. uh, and, uh, I, I, you know, I've, I've listened to it. It's very pleasant. Uh, it's haunting and all that. It's what I, what I told Katrink when I said, I said, yeah, it's good. It's, it's not irritating because um, there's so much new age music or stuff that's, that's, you know, it just irritates me. But she really puts a lot into it. Uh, and she does oh, a lot that's of good. touring. That's good. And it's good to be comp yeah. because it's way more expensive than uh, uh, most things here. Uh, yeah. And uh, anyway, so we're going to that. Uh, nice. That's neat. Oh, I, I wanted to say... And I grew up in a home where I could wake up to a string quartet playing. Actually, a quintet. My mother would be on the piano with. Uh, oh wow! Nice. Four, yeah, uh, that was wonderful. I loved it. And she, she, yeah. You know, I'd go with her to pick up opera singers at the airport, and uh-huh. uh, fifty years on the opera board in Fort Worth. <laughs> wow! Nice. Yeah, that's wonderful. That was yeah. neat. Uh, so I appreciate that, uh, what you said about your wife. Uh, well, that's great. That's great. Uh, you are uh, an eternal student, and um, you're just flying higher and higher. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm just trying to keep my head above water. <laughs> yeah. Well, that business of yours looks very impressive, Uh the next time I'm in Novato, I'll be sure to go see. Uh, oh, please, yeah, please. Lotus Group yeah. USA. USA. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I want you to. 
I'm going to send you a link to a, a song of mine that we did here. Please. We've done a bunch of yeah. them, and I want you to listen to it on, on what, what, what are your prize speakers? That, that that whole article was on those speakers. The Granadas? Yeah. The, the, the beatnik, the beatnik audio file. Yeah, no, the, uh, it's the, the Lotus Group Granada loudspeaker. Yeah. Uh huh. All right. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I want you to, uh, give me a, a review, uh, of, uh, a song on those loudspeakers. And we do all sorts so of I'll, different sounding stuff, but I thought that might be interesting. Yeah, I'd like to hear it. I, I'd have to burn it to a CD because I'm I'm kind of in the in the dark ages. I don't do any streaming or um, you know file serving. I just play CDs for digital and LPs for analog. Wow, <laughs> you can't in your high end audio file <laughs> store. You can't you can't play something off a off a computer? Oh, uh, not yet. I mean, ultimately, I guess I will, but I haven't. I I did actually build a little server. I I could probably, yeah, I probably could. Can I? I have to think of uh, if I can make that particular piece work. I might be able to make that work. Wow, but, um, that is shocking. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> that. You know, this reminds me of. Do you remember Mike Phillips? Uh He's still, so, yeah. he's still going. Oh, he'd certainly been his, it, it maybe late eighties. Mm. Uh, and I wasn't that long ago. I, I talked to him. I did a podcast with him. He's, he's he uh, created MasterCard as vice president of, uh, Wells Fargo. Oh my goodness. The, the mm. first interbank card. He became vice president of Bank of America. And wow. then he, he got out of that level, founded the Briar Patch Network of Small Businesses and uh, mm -hmm. has been a, you know, a financial consultant, all sorts of stuff. A really, uh, you know, uh, expert witness for trials. He does that. Uh, oh. uh, anyway, uh, I've met so many great people through him and great things. He was Wonderful advisor to Zen Center and everything. Anyway, so I run into him one day, a long time ago, decades ago. And he said, said hey, look at my new, my new, uh, calculator. And it was like calculators were sort of new, you know? Uh, uh -huh. but, but, or, well, I don't know how new they were. Uh, it was handheld. It was extremely calculated. He looked, he said, look, I can, uh, I can show you, you know, interest compounded, blah, blah, blah. And I can do the square root of right. something. And I can, you know, all these complicated things. And I said to him, uh, uh, what's uh, 72 times, uh, 8,450? And he couldn't figure out how to do it. <laughs> he couldn't do simple <laughs> arithmetic. I mean, I'm sure later he could. And he said, well, look, yeah. well, let's say, it was sort of like new math, you know? Where you can't yeah, just yeah, use regular yeah. numbers. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, you, you're saying that you'd have to burn a CD. Uh, yeah. Well, then uh, you'll just have to. Uh, I'll, I'll, but you should probably just burn the whole album. It's only 30 minutes or something. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right. Well, um, <laughs> it keeps getting more interesting. Um, I know. Uh, well, we've got to stop meeting like this. That was all really interesting. I really enjoyed it. And, yeah, me too. And I'm glad we did this one. And I'll go on and put up today's with, uh, you know, I'll put in a thing that says, uh, this is part one. Next week, uh, we'll be, uh, focusing on music. Or, nice. Well, uh, send, send me a link too. I'll, I'll be curious. You'll get it. You'll get it. All right. Okay. All right. Take David, care. Thank you so much. Thank Take you. Care. That was fun. Yeah. Thanks. Come visit. Bye -bye. Come visit. We have a oh, guest room. Lovely. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All bye, right. bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. So thanks a lot, Joe, for uh, 
podcast number two. Very interesting stuff about your music. Uh, and pardon me for throwing in something on my own. I wanted to hear, uh, what, you know, like I said, what he thought about uh, the one particular song sounding on his speakers. Of course, I'd like him to hear all of them. Uh, <laughs> but getting somebody to listen to one is doing pretty good. Um, and I'll tell you the one. It's called Offerings. And it has an Indonesian name, too, because it's half an Indonesian. But it's Simbahan, but it's Simbahan. And uh, their, their plurals are doubled. Uh, so for Simbahan, it's Offerings. And it compares the offerings, the constant offerings they make here to the good spirits and the gods and everything, uh, constantly, every day, multiple times, uh, all over. Uh, and, uh, and the offerings that we make to evil spirits, which uh, is trash and plastic and pollution and, you know, that sort of thing. So it compares the two. And unfortunately, our, our self-destructive offerings are uh, outweighing the beneficial ones in terms of our survival is my feeling. So anyway, this song sort of expresses that. And um, if you listen to it, you'll, you, you might hear in the ominous uh, sort of part of it, uh, I wanted to hear what he thought that sounded like on those really good speakers. So um, uh, the name of the album is Bad Intentions. Um, and that's oh, The name of the album actually is Bali Yuga, Bad Intentions, because all the albums we did here start with the name Bali Yuga, which is the name of our band, which is a studio band. Uh and um, if you go to baliyuga.com, that just opens up on my music site, Diffuser Music. And right there you can see uh, a link to Bali Yuga, the Bali Yuga section of it. But you can also see a link to all D DC artist pages. Uh, so if you click that, you can choose uh, whether to go to YouTube or Spotify or Apple Music or Deezer or Amazon. Uh, and then there, just look for the Bali Yuga album and click on Offerings. Uh, so uh, thanks for joining us. It was great talking with uh, Joe. It was great having you here. And... Uh, I'll see you again next week uh, with another guest. Um, you might notice that this is Joe is this is Joe's uh, that today's is uh, guest uh, number eighty-two. Actually, there've been about I don't know fifty or more other guests, but I, I called the first fifty or whatever chats. There were phone chats, and at some point I got tired of calling them phone chats, and I started a new folder with guest. So I was thinking, well, maybe I should just start another folder <laughs> and start renumbering it from the total number we've had. But we've also had um, Life in Bali over 50 guests. So I guess it's uh, like 80, 50, 130. Um, um, it's it's, it's going to hit 200 at some point. I'd like to go back to doing uh, Life in Bali. I'm just, there's too much happening. I'm trying to get this book finished, and I can hardly get to it. There's just so much comes this way uh, from the Cuke Archive stuff. But anyway, enough of all that. Thanks for joining us. And um, until we meet again, I'm D.C. Poo of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Senor with Doggett Bandita and dear lovely Katrinka. And we're wishing you and yours and all of us a grand awakening.